universities are very slow to adapt because remember, they are one of long standing organizations in modern society. Name the organizations that have been around, not decades, centuries. These computational methods, not new. They've been using out computer algorithms to award and deny loan applications, college admissions applications, and so on for many decades now. You know, my advice would be if you're a STEM major, don't forget to take some courses in history and comp lit. And if you're a, a history comp lit major, don't forget to, to take some courses in STEM fields so you can understand science and the changing technology that's transforming society. Joining me today is Dr. Richard Aram, a professor of sociology and education at UC Irvine and the director of the UCI MUST project. Welcome to the program, Doctor. Naja, excited to be here with you today. Awesome. So we uh, at this show um, talk a lot about the implications of AI amidst the rise of uh, large language models. Uh, I'd like to, you to tell me the first impressions when you first started interacting with ChatGPT around two years ago, in the end of 2022. What was your initial reactions? What did you think about this technology? Were you following it before? And just generally, what did you think as a first impression? Yeah, I was uh, very attentive to its launch and uh, its uh, adoption uh, in the academy and uh, as well as resistance to it. Uh, I personally found it an extraordinarily powerful tool uh, and was impressed by its capabilities and uh, saw the transformative potential it could potentially have on education and society. And this is a great venue to start the conversation. So what do you think those implications, the highlights of those implications are on education? Let me give you some context. So in my master's thesis recently, I, you know, I think that it is. It, it, it was interesting because at first, uh, the university, I, California State University, that I was, uh, you know, submitting the master's thesis for, had um, didn't have a policy on ChatGPT, and then they start using this tool, Turnitin, I believe, or something like that, that will check for AI generated content. But then in the in the middle of that semester, they kind of stopped checking for AI generated content because there was a lot of false positives and false negatives. So, but then at the same time, you know, students can easily go to ChatGPT to write their entire thing. And oftentimes I found it firsthand that it can fabricate reality. Like it, it will refer you to studies that haven't that does not exist. So I found it this very disturbing as well. Yes, well, you know, of course, all tools can be uh, both used as well as abused. So uh, I think one of the things you would hope would happen in education would be to uh, work with students uh, as well as uh, researchers and faculty and society more broadly on helping them to identify constructive uses, productive uses for these sorts of tools that are developing. Uh, you would hope that universities would be kind of at the forefront of thinking through some of these issues and applications uh, to assist uh, individuals in accomplishing their goals more productively. And so I do think because uh, ChatGPT and these other language processing programs are uh, so powerful and sophisticated, it opens up new emerging questions and issues. But I also would have to say they build upon prior tools and computational methods and computational resources that have already raised many of these questions before. And so uh, I don't think we uh, we need to approach this kind of issue uh, as if um, we've never thought about 
these challenges uh, before. You know, think of, for, for example, the use of the calculator in math classes. Uh, you know, we've we've developed effective policies for that. You know, for over the past decades, right? That you can use the calculator for some task. It's helpful. It's time saving. But then there's other places where you're taking a formal assessment that that calculating tool may not be appropriate and it will it would be banned. Yeah. And this is exactly what I want to ask you. Why universities are so slow in adopting change and moving forward? Because I've been uh, my, my, my family, we own a private school back in Lebanon. And, you know, when I was like probably seven, eight, ten years ago, I've been hearing about flipped classrooms and why it's important. And till this day, I don't, I still don't see a flipped classroom. And I feel that this is one way to mitigate the impact of AI and all, and all of this. So instead of having the lecture to be a professor giving a lecture and telling you the information, instead, you know, you should uh, send the students home, let them do their, their research or a recorded lecture, whatever. And then the, the place for the classroom is for debate for public speaking, for nurturing those critical thinking skills within the, the classroom environment. Um, and I feel that this is, this, is the, you know, this is a better approach, at least to what we're having right now. But universities are very slow to adopt anything new. So why is that? Yeah. Well, we, first of all, uh, UCI uh, is, you know, as a particular case, we've been very focused on promoting flipped classrooms and active learning. So I, I think they're adopting uh, these practices, but slowly and too slowly. So we're frustrated. And so the question, why is that the case? Uh, I would say two things. One, education scholars talk about this grammar of schooling, the grammar of schooling, the taken for granted assumptions of what effective teaching and student learning must look like. And we've inherited these grammar of schooling from when we were young and what we saw uh, our teachers do. And so we're very hard to, to the cultural change necessary to let go of that and actually do something new. That's, that's one thing. The second thing, Naja, when you ask about the universities, Universities are very slow to adapt and reluctant to change because remember, they are one of the most successful long standing organizations in modern society. You know, let's set aside maybe the Catholic Church you know, some religious organizations, other than, other than these organizations, name the organizations that have been uh, around in continuous operation for not decades, centuries. Many of the, you know, the universities and colleges in Europe, continuous operation success for 500, 600 years with this blueprint of organizational practices and behaviors. And so you go to an organization that has this structural logic of success and you say, hey, the world's changing. If you don't change, you're gonna get displaced by new trend, new disruptive technologies like instruction on YouTube. If you don't change, you're going to confront that. And you say that to an, to an organization that's been around for 500, 600 years and has been successful by changing at a glacial pace. It's going to put a, an, an, a break going to create organizational inertia. And so that is, I think, in fact, you know, another uh, primary reason for why the 
the technology in society is changing very quickly, but the institutions are change are not keeping up with those uh, changing opportunities and challenges. And so I think we are at a at a point where there's a, a disconnect because of these different these organizational dynamics. Let's switch back to ChatGPT and these large language models and other AI yes, tools. Yes, we digress a little bit from our core topic. <laughs> yeah, I just want to know your policy in your class, or if there is any UCI policy that you can talk about when it comes to turning in assignments or writing through these uh, tools. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's a. I guess we can talk about policy. We could also talk about how I've attempted to use it. Mm -hmm. And I can also tell you from this measurement, pro so I'm directing the UCI MUST project, Measuring Undergraduate Success Trajectories Project, where we've integrated unprecedented data at UCI to understand students' experiences, trajectories, and outcomes. It, all the administrative data on students on campus, combined with the learning management systems data from Canvas, all the clickstream data, we combine those two. We longitudinally survey students during their first year on a weekly basis, where we ask about their experiences and their attitudes and so on. We uh, provide them with performance assessments, measuring 21st century skills on, multi on different time points in their, in their careers. We uh, also use experiential sampling methods where we buzz students on their phones, on their smartphones, and give them a quick 30-second uh, um, survey at random times. Where are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? And your psychological state. We have all this data integrated. Uh, I, I believe it's the deepest data in higher education to understand students' experiences. So I can talk to you about from that study also what we've observed about ChatGPT and student use and instructional encouragement for it. But um, uh, you started by asking me about the ChatGPT policies in the classroom, we don't have a campus-wide policy that I'm aware of. Uh, my policy is very easy in when I teach in the undergraduate prison education program because they don't have internet access. So they're not able to see ChatGPT. But last, the, the winter of 2023, ChatGPT gets introduced in November, late November. I'm teaching January uh, um, in the prison education program. And on the first day, I gave them, I asked ChatGPT to write a letter of introduction for a prison education program for a sociologist teaching a research methods course. And it wrote this beautiful letter of introduction saying it was it under it recognized the challenges and obstacles that they were likely to face as, as incarcerated students, uh, but then saw the promise and potential of this. And I copied that and gave it to them. So there's a new thing called ChatGPT out there that you should take a, a look at. The, uh, a week or two later, I don't know whether you remember that New York Times reporter, Kevin Roos, he did that, that back and forth with ChatGPT when ChatGPT encouraged him to d divorce, divorce his wife and have an affair with him. Remember before they put the guardrails on it, on the ChatGPT? And I gave that transcript to the students. I said, you got to check out this. This is, you know, this is something going on out there in society that, you know, you, you're only partially aware of, if at all, because you don't have internet access. Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can relate. But I think a common theme in what you're talking about in this episode is, I mean, speaking from the prison experience, 
to the minority and how they tend to uh, want to learn for like I don't, don't, they don't want to take shortcuts or they prefer the traditional method and speaking about even my experience about like hunger I feel that there's like a common theme is related to the students background and mindset when they go to higher education and how important is adversity or um, coming to high, higher education with a mindset of wanting to learn versus, uh, oh, I just want this for prestige. So I think the purpose behind enrollment is an important factor in how students experience education. So I feel that, is, is this a good description of what? Yeah, I think, well, I would say people definitely bring, uh, it's a, bring different things to the institution in terms of their motivations and orientations and dispositions. But to me, that only goes so far because what gets produced on college is a joint product of the interaction between the individual and the institution. And so, yes, people might come with different motivations, background, dispositions, even skills. But once they're here, then the, the institution has the, the, the ability to intentionally design interactions with them that can shape their trajectories and cultivate and develop their, uh, their individual capacities. And if we don't do that, then it's an institutional failure, not the failure of the individual. You know, that's, again, I'm a, I'm a sociologist. So I often, I, I'm looking for the social, the social context, the social institution that, uh, its role in, some of these larger problems that were that we observe. Yeah, we talked a lot about the implications on the education, and uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about the MUST program and what's the end goal of it. As uh, is like, what is why why the MUST project has been started, and what is the end end goal? And then I'll I'll end by asking you about the broader broader implications of this technology on on society and sense of worth. Yeah, great, great. So the the Must project uh, we're now uh, just finished its fifth year, sixth you know sixth year, uh, and it was originally funded by the Mellon Foundation that was interested in improving undergraduate measurement to understand the value of what it calls liberal arts education not just that doesn't mean just majoring in something like the humanities it means this broader notion of uh, liberal arts education that's has been a core design feature of, of uh, universities in the west for uh, many centuries now and so in order to look at the value of these forms of education, the foundation believed you had to improve measurement so that you weren't just looking at crude outcomes like how much money does someone make if they major in a particular field. So that was the original design of the program. We've uh, subsequently gotten additional funding from uh, the Bureau of Justice that's interested in us looking at the lifted program, the prison education program. We've got an additional funding uh, from the Templeton Foundation that is interested in promoting intellectual virtues on campus. I know you had my colleague Duncan Pritchard uh, uh, on uh, your podcast uh, a few months ago. I very much enjoyed listening to that interaction. Uh, with the two of you. We uh, are now getting funding from the Strata Education Foundation and, particular, and possibly another 
funder we're, we're just about to hear final word from focusing on college to career transitions in particular looking at experiential learning out opportunities that happen outside the formal classroom internships um, uh, for example um, when doing work at uci but also at northeastern university northeastern university has a program called co-op experiential learning every undergraduate student two semesters during their trajectory they have to disenroll from college and work full-time for pay in it uh with an with a firm and that's part of the pedagogical design and so we're we're looking at at these kind of very powerful uh uh experiential learning programs that are linked linking college to career we're also using our data at uci to observe uh, uh, job search uh, so students in this uh, career service program called handshake there's another one at northeastern called Sim simplicity they they use these to sign up for career services advisement career career fairs uh, workshops on their on per, per, on developing resumes applying for internships applying for jobs and you can see what jobs they're they're applying for and what jobs they're not and we we have uh in this data set uh 400 000 jobs that are posted in the uci handshake system now how do we analyze 400 000 jobs and the characteristics of students applying to that well nausea you know the answer we have we have AI programs now that can code the text of these of these job postings for various characteristics involved. And then we can see based on social background of the students, what type of program, what type of jobs people are applying to and what type they're not. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, I've told you a little bit about the funders and some of the projects. Uh, the campus has also provided some uh, base level of support to, to uh, continue ongoing data collection, meaning they're supporting uh, uh, our ability to continue to survey students and bring in new cohorts. And they're doing it because one of the core uh, goals of the project is to improve institutional performance on campus, to engage in con on data-driven continuous improvement opportunities. And so uh, as a researcher, I want to improve knowledge of higher ed and student pathways in general and the scientific understanding of these processes. But as a educator and a practitioner, I want to work in my uh, local context in school to use my, my professional skills, measurement, social science measurement, to use data to create data-driven um, uh, approaches to improving how we intentionally design for student success. Just briefly, because um, I feel that you're the best person to ask this question to. If you're someone, if, if you have like a, a children in, uh, approaching higher education want to be enrolled in college do you advise them to go the social sciences liberal arts humanities kind of majors based on what you've discovered in the must uh, research or you you you, pro you prefer uh, or you would recommend going the stem majors who do you think in this new age that we live in uh, which side has more potential prospect or um, have value? Yeah, so my my thoughts would be the following. First of all, um, a lot of it depends on the on the individual interest of the student. And so I think it would be uh, we'd be doing a disservice 
to uh, individual students to not uh, start by trying to understand what their needs and interests are. Remember, we talked earlier about the, the, the one of the great things about AI is it can personalize, it can be adaptive. So you, you'd want to start with the students' needs and then kind of advise. I would say some general things, though, and that is um, one of the original logics of liberal arts education was this idea of course breadth that even if you were focused on a narrow discipline, maybe with a professional occupation, that it be complemented with courses from other fields. Uh, so you could develop larger dispositions and uh, competencies and develop understanding of concepts that, that could help your, your larger higher order development, your uh, larger uh, cognitive growth. And so, uh, you know, my advice would be if you're a STEM major, don't forget to take some courses in history and comp lit. And if you're a, a history comp lit major, don't forget to, to take some courses in STEM fields that uh, so you can understand science and the changing technology that's transforming society. So that'd be another kind of general advice I would give them. The third piece of advice is I would have given even before AI ChatGPT growth in the last couple of years, and that is the change in the economy, the technological pace of change is so great that you're poorly served by focusing on too narrow a program in specific occupational uh, uh, trajectories. Why? Because that occupation might not exist in five years, that um, the firm might not exist, the, the sector might not exist. There's, the, the, the pace of change is so great that the cost of narrow specialization has increased. And so you're, again, course, a little bit of course breath, a little bit about hedging, so that you build these larger competencies so you're uh, able to adapt to changes, to move from job to job when necessary, occupation to occupation, to uh, develop a, a lifelong passion for education and ongoing skill development and comp, you know, uh, developing those sorts of cap capacities and orientations, I think would be more important than either where you, what you major in or where you go, because it, you, you, uh, a person in any institution is able to engage in this transformative character of, of education, uh, even if the institution itself isn't designed effectively to uh, ensure that that happens. Yeah, I, I know we're, we're running a little bit out of time, but I don't want to miss the chance of asking you as a sociologist about the fact that we have built AI systems that will determine if our resume get filtered for a job based on an algorithm that will determine whether we get a loan or not, whether we get insured or not, whether we probably get admitted to a university or not. Um, an AI system that potentially could be smarter, could have autonomy, you know, they're building all these agency so that these systems not only respond to what you prompt them, but also take action and have their own goals and be active in society and potentially be equipping the robots that we were going to be seeing in every home, you know, eventually. What are the sociological implications, do you think, briefly? Um, I know this is probably not your, um, like, you, you haven't put a lot of uh, research in, but just from, from your perspective, what do you think the implications are? Yeah, well, so uh, one, I would point out that these computational methods, again, are not new. They've been using out computer algorithms to award and deny loan applications, college admissions applications, and so on 
for many decades now. Uh, so I, certainly AI will probably accelerate and make those, you know, uh, accelerate and further refine uh, some of these applications. Uh, we know from a, you know, many years of study that we need to be uh, worried about uh, implicit bias in uh, the algorithms and AI programs that, of course, have been developed based on the existing data from society, which itself is steeped in these implicit biases. And so the, it's not the AI machine's fault. It's our fault for, for creating this corpus of information that is so flawed uh, and uh, biased in, uh, in these ways. So it, it, it's, uh, we need to worry about that and the societal implications of that. We, uh, um, you know, another piece obviously is uh, a lot of these AI programs are leading to the further concentration of power and wealth in society. And so I think there's uh, increased risk, not of the AI machines making uh, um, technologically to transforming society and creating more wealth and prosperity for the society. But the problem that that the concentration of power and uh, uh, power and resources behind these systems, that the benefits and the cost of these, these technological changes are not going to be equally distributed. I think that you'd have to be worried about that, um, looking at it as in like a technology, like any technology, uh, you know, again, we have thousands of years as human beings of new technologies coming in and how they get um, adopted in society and appropriated by those in power or not. But I think that that's a, a, an additional piece that one would, uh, would, would need to think about. But, you know, again, I don't want to want to end like these are powerful tools that have the capacity to improve many aspects of society and how we organize and uh, organize and, and function in many different domains uh, in society. And we should not let our fear or our worry about their misuse prevent us from taking advantage of them and learning them and, and applying them in ways to help us achieve the outcomes that uh, we're hoping to in our society and, uh, and hoping to use them to kind of expand, expand equity, expand uh, prosperity, reduce the environmental harms in society, threatening all societies in, at, at this moment and leading to huge migratory flows throughout the world and international conflicts throughout the world that are threatening the, you know, the, the political bases of many of these societies. We, we're confronting these serious problems. Let's use these tools we have as imperfect and as they are to try and solve some of these societal problems and not be paralyzed by our, uh, our fear and our worries about them. Dr. Aram, uh, thanks for speaking to me. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Nasha, for making this opportunity for us.